Pray with me, please. Father, we have just sung that we would turn our eyes, turn our eyes off of the cares and the distraction, the busyness that consumes so much of our lives. That is easier said than done, and so, Father, we ask this morning for your help, that by your Spirit you would quicken our hearts so that this morning we would be able to turn our focus to the one who is worthy of it. Lord, I pray that as now as we look to your word, that you would even now prepare our hearts to hear from you. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Turn in your copy of the scriptures, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Assume with me for a moment, if you will, that you are about to become the new lead teaching pastor of your church. Let's just assume that that's you for just a moment. Your church has just wrapped up a sermon series in the book of Titus. Before that was James, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and then of course the book of Isaiah. So other than those five books that your church has recently studied, you can start a new sermon series, what will be your first real sermon series, on any book of the Bible. You have 61 options that you can choose from. Now, realistically, I think that it's unlikely that you would choose to unpack the book of Revelation for your first sermon series. So we'll take that one off. I also think you're not likely to launch from the book of Leviticus, let's just say. But even still, you now have 59 options that you can choose from. Where would you start? That, I think, is a daunting question. Because when you consider the riches and the depth of every single book of the Word of God, every book worthy of a sermon series, of sermon series, that we can never exhaust the depths or the riches of the wisdom of God that is contained in His Word, it actually makes choosing any one book difficult because there are so many options to choose from. So where would you start? Of course, this scenario, this hypothetical scenario, is a very real scenario in my particular case. And I've been wrestling with the question of what book of the Bible I would start with for more than the last year. And if you ask me at different times over the months of the last year, I had different answers at different times. Some of you know I love the Psalms, so I strongly considered a sermon series through the Psalter. And every time I read through the book of Judges, I'm just struck by how much rich application there is in the book of Judges. Every time I read through it, I think this would be a really fun book to teach. And I really, for the longest time, have wanted to preach through a gospel. In fact, that was the runaway favorite, I'd say, for most of the last year. I want to preach a gospel. But we are going to be going in a different direction. Because as I was wrestling with what book of the Bible I should start with, I couldn't get a line from a movie, of all things, out of my head. The setting for the scene of this movie is the mountainside of Salzburg, Austria. A group of children, accompanied by their governess, are picnicking in this picturesque spot. And the governess, of course, she picks up a guitar. And you know what happens next. She begins to play. And the beautiful voice of Julie Andrews, who, of course, plays the governess, Maria, in the movie The Sound of Music, begins to sing this classic line, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So this morning, we are beginning a new series entitled Foundations that will take us through the book of Genesis. Now, before we even get into the text this morning, and before we even begin to introduce the book of Genesis this morning, I actually want to start by giving you four reasons why I want to study this book with you. Four reasons that we are studying the book of Genesis together. So here's reason number one. Because the beginning really is a good place to start. The name of the book, Genesis, of course means the beginning or the origin of something. Which comes from the very first word of the book which happens to be, of course, the first word of all of the Bible, the word breshit. It means in the beginning. 
which means that everything that has ever happened or ever will happen in the history of the world begins subsequent to the event that is described in Genesis 1, verse 1. Now, in the post-truth age, the post-modern age that you and I find ourselves living in, there is little that is more important to our culture today than the erasure and the reconstruction of history. Why is that? Well, because the objective truth of history is impossible to reconcile with the subjective truth claims of the present. In other words, it will be harder to convince you of the lie of so-called subjective truth if history shows you what is in fact objectively true. And if that's true of history in general, it is particularly true of biblical history. The book of Genesis presents us with the only infallible historical record of what really happened in the very beginning. And it turns out that what happened in the beginning of the story is profoundly important to the present and is profoundly important to the future. So as I considered where we should begin our sermon series for the fall, the beginning seems to be a very good place to start. It's important for us to study Genesis number 2 because the book of Genesis, it lays the foundation. It lays the foundation for our story for the biblical story, and for God's redemptive plan for the world. The integrity or the strength of any structure is only as sound as the strength of its foundation. It doesn't matter how large or how impressive or how beautifully constructed a building is, if the foundation is in some way compromised, then the whole structure is susceptible to collapse. We had the opportunity, Corinne and I, a number of years ago to spend a little bit of time in the United Kingdom a number of years ago. And I, I love cathedrals. One of my favorite parts about that whole trip was walking through and exploring the incredible architecture of these massive churches. If you go into my office, there's a watercolor painting hanging there of Wells Cathedral. But my favorite cathedral that the time we were there is Salisbury Cathedral. I'm actually having a picture of this painted for my office because I love it so much. Salisbury Cathedral is an English cathedral in the Gothic style that was built in the 1200s. For context, this cathedral was built in a remarkable 38 years without any mechanized machinery, which for the time is unbelievable. Most cathedrals of this type and at that time took between 150 and 250 years to build. It would go through multiple generations of architects and masons. So this is an incredible building in its own right. It required 70 thousand tons of stone that was hewn from a local quarry and then dragged by horseback to the the scene of the build. 3,000 tons of timber and 450 tons of lead went into that structure. And when all of that was done, the bishop of the town looked at his cathedral and he decided that it was missing something, that it needed a spire, which is that huge tower you see sticking out of the center of the building that wasn't originally part of the plan. And not just any spire, but this needed to be a huge, massive spire. In fact, that spire remains the tallest spire in all of England. Now, the reason for this tower was because, of course, the greater the tower, the greater the cathedral, the more people who would come to the town to see the cathedral. The more people who came to the town to see the cathedral, the more people who would donate money to the cathedral. And the more people who donated money to the cathedral would inadvertently be donating money to the bishop. So, of course, the bishop's plan, let's build this spire, and that's exactly what they did. That spire rises a towering 404 feet into the sky. That is nearly half the length of the Titanic. The weight of that spire is 6,500 tons of stone and timber framing, which is equal to approximately 950 adult elephants or 3,500 cars or nearly three-fifths the weight of the Eiffel Tower. And that monstrous tower was set on top of a building that was never originally designed to have a spire. And predictably, the foundation began to collapse. It couldn't hold up under the strain. It, It wasn't built to sustain that kind of weight placed upon it. 
And so every year for the last several hundred years, they have had to build new scaffolding around the tower. And they've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds every year restoring and shoring up the foundation just to keep the whole church from collapsing. Because you see, the strength or the weakness of a foundation limits what you can safely build upon it. The narrative of the book of Genesis lays the foundation for the entire Christian worldview. I would submit to you that if we do not have a strong and grounded understanding of the essential truths that the book of Genesis teaches, then we have not sufficiently laid the foundation of a faith that will be capable of standing. What we believe about God, God is creator, God is author, God is judge, God as redeemer. And what we believe about the universe, how it got here, why it's here, where it's going, what we believe about ourselves, what it means to be human, what it means to be created in the image of God, what it means to be made male and female, why there are such things as evil and death and suffering in our world, why in the midst of all of this death and suffering there is still some source of hope and a promise for the future that God has some kind of plan for redemption. All of these foundational bedrock truths that answer the biggest questions about life and the biggest questions about why we believe what we believe, they are all laid here in the book of Genesis. That's why this series is called Foundations, because in studying Genesis, we are revisiting together foundational truths, truths that are worth building our lives, our faith, and our worldview upon. And it turns out that understanding the beginning of the story is crucial if we would understand the end of the story. We won't understand and appreciate, for example, what God promises to one day do in Revelation until we first understand his vision of creation that is revealed to us in the opening chapters of Genesis. And so this book is foundational. It's foundational to our story to the biblical story, to the Christian worldview, and for ultimately God's redemptive purpose for the world. Why is it important for us to study Genesis? Reason number three. Because the issues addressed in Genesis are incredibly relevant to us. Worldview begins, after all, with what we believe about the world. It's hardly surprising to find that few books of the Bible are as regularly scrutinized, maligned, and attacked as the book of Genesis, even among so-called professing Christians. It's actually amazingly difficult to find a good commentary on the book of Genesis. By a good commentary, I mean simply a commentary that is willing to take the book of Genesis seriously and literally. But I'll tell you who does take the book of Genesis seriously. Jesus does. The New Testament apostles and authors do. Who regularly cite the book of Genesis and who argue in their teaching and in their writing that Genesis tells us about God's essential greatness. About who we are. Tells us about the nature and sacredness of marriage. Tells us about the purpose behind our maleness and femaleness in marriage, in the home, in the church, and in society tells us about our purpose and the beauty of our sexuality, tells us about the truth and horror of our sin nature, tells us about the eternal nature of God's covenant promises to us. Do issues like these, do they sound like matters that would be relevant to us and to our times? The answer is, of course, absolutely yes. So I'm excited about this study Because from the opening lines of the Bible's very first book, we discover exactly how profoundly relevant the scriptures are to our lives, to our situation, and to the times we are living in. Why is it important for us to study Genesis? Reason number four. Because the book of Genesis is an excellent introduction to the Gospels. I told you a few moments ago that I am eager to preach one of the Gospels, and I'm very eager indeed. But before we study the coming of the second Adam, I think it is fitting for us to look closely at the effects of the first Adam. The book of Genesis not only lays the foundation, but it in fact sets the stage 
It sets the stage for the unfolding drama of God's redemptive plan and the meta narrative or the big story of the scriptures. My hope is that once we have finished Genesis, that we will be well primed to study one of the Gospels. That's where we're going. So we have four reasons why we are studying the book of Genesis right now. But let me make a brief remark about how we will work our way through this study. My hope and expectation is that, Lord willing, we will be in this study for just under a year and a half. Don't laugh. Don't laugh, I said. Now, of course, that plan is subject to change. We make our plans and we hold them loosely. But the plan is to wrap up our study of Genesis shortly before Christmas of next year, just in time to begin a new series through one of the Gospels. Now, some of you may be thinking that that feels like a very fast timeline for this book. Genesis is a large book. It has 50 chapters. So you might be thinking that a book like that should take us several years to work through. But we need to remember that Genesis is a narrative which means that we often need to actually understand the narrative in large chunks in order to understand the main point of each passage. It's actually harmful at times to look at a narrative in too small a section because you actually miss the whole trajectory of what the story is teaching us about the nature of man and about the nature of God. We need to understand the whole story oftentimes before we're able to actually understand the main point, which is different than, say, studying an epistle where Paul is trying to pack each verse in with as much doctrine as he can possibly stuff into it. And if you go too fast, you're you're missing profound theological truths. You have to work your way slowly. But that's not how narrative works. And so we need to actually appropriately handle the narrative according to how much of the narrative the text is presenting to us. So at times in our our study of the book of Genesis, we will move very slowly, especially in these opening couple of weeks. And then at other times, we'll be handling larger chunks of the narrative, sometimes a chapter, maybe even more at a time. That will be dictated according to the narrative flow of the book. And there are two things that I think will help us as we go through this study together. The first is that I would encourage you to read the text that we will be preaching on a couple of times each week prior to Sunday. In the e-news, in the middle of the week, we publish the text that we will be looking at together on Sunday morning. So it, you know in advance what it is that we'll be looking at on Sunday. I'd encourage you to read through the text a couple of times to familiarize yourself with the details of the narrative. But the second thing is that there will always, no matter how much or how little we're looking at, there will always be more depth to the text than we can ever possibly look at in a single sermon. Pastors always struggle with what they have to keep out of their sermons, what they have to cut out of their study. This is what pastors call the cutting for, what gets left in our office that we never get to bring to the pulpit. And it tortures us most of the time. You think, man, he droned on for 50 minutes. It could have been an hour and 30 minutes for all that you know. Each week on Tuesdays, we are going to be recording a mini 10-minute podcast that we're going to call the cutting floor, where I'm going to be addressing things in the text that didn't make it into the sermon. And you will have the opportunity from Sunday morning after the sermon until Tuesday morning to send in any questions that you may have, either from the text or from the sermon, that you would like us to potentially address on that podcast. You can submit those questions through our website or using some of the information that's provided to you on the sermon notes. And my hope is going to be that the sermon is going to convey the main idea of of the text. And then that the podcast will cover some interesting details in the text that didn't make it into the sermon. So with all of that introductory background stuff out there for us, we now actually want to move into considering our text. But before we can actually open the text itself, we need to lay a little bit of introductory framework for the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first of the five book set that open the scripture, which is frequently referred to as the Pentateuch, or the five books composed of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, in Deuteronomy. These five books are often referred to as the law or the Torah. These five books, including the book of Genesis, I believe, were written by Moses. Now, there are plenty of scholars today who would dispute the Mosaic authorship of any of these five books and of Genesis in particular. I'm not interested today in getting into that discussion. I firmly believe that the book of Genesis was written by Moses. The only thing I will say about this is that both Jesus and the New Testament authors 
clearly assign the authorship of the book of Genesis to Moses. Because whenever they quote the book of Genesis, they will frequently say, as Moses said, or as you have heard Moses say. And my supposition is this, that if Jesus really is God the Son, and that if Jesus is correct when he says of himself, before Abraham was, I am, that then when he quotes from the book of Genesis and he says it is from Moses, that he knows who actually authored this book. So that's going to be my assumption as we work through the text, that Moses is rightly the author of Moses, uh, of Genesis. And so these books, these five opening books of the Bible, they are frequently referred to rightly as the law of Moses. I think as we work our way through Genesis, we're going to be struck by the remarkable sophistication of the book of Genesis. And I think that that literary sophistication and the elegance and the masterful composition of this book should not be surprising to us when we consider two things. The first is the biography of Moses himself. Because in Exodus we learn that Moses, although he is a Hebrew child, he grew up in Pharaoh's household while the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Moses grew up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, that he enjoyed all of the privileges associated as being growing up as near royalty in one of the wealthiest nations in all of the ancient Near East. And presumably, one of the privileges associated with that position was a world-class education. And so in Pharaoh's household, God was not only preparing a young Moses to eventually lead his people, but he was also equipping Moses to be able to write the account that would lay the foundation for the rest of the biblical story. He was giving Moses the tools that would later develop into the authorship of the book of Moses, or the book of Genesis. I keep saying that, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, we also need to remember, as well as all of the rest of Scripture, that we need to remember that behind the human authors stands one divine author. And so when we are surprised at how masterful the book of Genesis is, or at times when Moses seems to know or understand things he shouldn't know yet, for example, how does Moses keep pointing so clearly to Christ? How does he keep doing that? He shouldn't know anything about what he's writing about. We need to remember that behind the human author stands one divine author. Because we believe that the scriptures are God-breathed. They are inspired. Meaning, as Peter tells us, that the scriptures were written by holy men of God who were carried or borne along by the Holy Spirit. We also learn in the book of Hebrews that these same men often strained their eyes looking into the end of the things that they were writing that they couldn't yet understand. And so the truth is that the human biblical authors frequently write better than they actually know, better than they actually understand because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now Moses is writing this Genesis account during the wilderness wanderings. You remember that following the Exodus, the Israelites flee from Egypt. They then come ultimately to the borders of the promised land. This is the land that God promised back to their forefather Abraham. He's now brought them out of the land of Egypt. He's brought them to the very edge of this promised land. And then the Israelites get scared. They send scouts into the land. They return with reports of some really tall men. There are giants in the land. And so rather than trust the God, the God who overthrew the gods of Egypt, who overthrew the army of Pharaoh, who opened a path in the midst of the sea, the God who rained bread down from heaven to feed a multitude, the God who made bitter water sweet, the God who thundered from Sinai, rather than trust this God, the people of Israel feared tall men. It's a classic case of when men are big and God seems small. And as a result of their lack of faith, God condemned that generation of Israelites to wander and die in the wilderness for 40 years, that only their children would eventually get to go in to the land of promise. I want to pause on that for just a moment and ask you to imagine for a second that you are a part of that younger generation of Israelites. Your entire youth has been spent wandering around and around and around in an arid wilderness. You've had no home, no stability, no settling down, no planting roots, no long-term estate planning. 
You've been in a 40-year holding cycle because you know what you are supposed to do, the place that you are supposed to live in, you can't enter into yet. That's been your whole life. Not yet. Not yet. Waiting and waiting. What are you waiting for? You are waiting for people to die. People that you love. And over time, your main occupation as a young Israelite becomes grave digging. That's your primary job. Digging graves, the graves of your grandparents and eventually your parents who did not trust God. And so for 40 years, you wander through a graveyard of those who did not believe the promises. Talk about an object lesson. The book of Genesis is written during these years of this wilderness wandering grave digging. And Moses writes the book of Genesis to that young generation of Israelites that is about to eventually go into the land. He writes a narrative that proclaims the story of the nation of Israel to the coming generation of Israel. That tells them of a God who is not only greater than the gods of Egypt that they knew as children, but of a God who created the heaven and the earth. Of a God who called their forefather Abraham, called him out of a pagan land in idol worship, then made promises to him, entered into a covenant with him, who then made Abraham's family into a great nation, sent them into Egypt, but promised that in 400 years he would call them back out of Egypt and bring them back to the promised land. And that is precisely the place that this young generation of Israelites find themselves, on the borders of the place that God promised he would bring them back to. And so in reading the book of Genesis, this young generation of Israelites are reading not only their history, but they're also discovering their God-promised future. And the genre, therefore, of the book of Genesis is that of historical narrative. This is not mythology. This is not a collection of cleverly devised myths and fables. From the style to the substance, down even to the grammatical structures that Moses uses, the primary genre of Genesis is clearly that of historical narration. This is an historical account of real people and real events as they truly happened. But knowing then the author and the purpose and the genre of Genesis, what can we say about the structure of Genesis? As we studied the book of Genesis, I I thought it would be helpful for us to look at an outline of the book to help us put some of the pieces together in our minds. There are two major sections in the book of Genesis. The first section is what we might call the primeval history. This is the account of the creation of the world, the subsequent corruption of the world, and then the judgment that comes as a result of the flood. And then the second section is what we might call the patriarchal history. And that follows the lives of Abraham and then the rest of his family. And that section occupies the majority of the book from 1110 all the way through the end of chapter 50. But within the book, there are five major movements that structure or outline the whole book of Genesis. And my hope is that by the time we are done with this study, that when you think back and you try to outline the book of Genesis, Genesis in your mind, that you could think in terms of these five major movements of the book. The five narrative movements of Genesis are, number one, creation, takes place in Genesis 1 and 2, followed by corruption, which is the fall, and then the degradation of man and the corruption of society. That takes place from Genesis 3, verse 1 to 6, 8. That's followed by judgment, which is God's holy response to the sin in his world. That's 6, 9 to 11, 9. And that's followed by promise, which is God's commitment out of judgment to redeem a people. That's from 11.10 to 25.18. Followed finally by plan, the beginning of how God's promise of redemption will be realized in the world. That's from, a, that's from 25.19 through the end of the book. And each of these five narrative movements is marked by what we would call a toledot statement. The word toledot is a literary device that Moses uses throughout the book of Genesis to mark a scene change or a movement change in the narrative. It would be like if you were watching a play 
and suddenly one scene ends and the curtain closes, the lights go down, and then there's a pause for a moment. The lights come back up, the curtain opens. And all of that is a visual cue informing you in the audience that one act in the drama has finished and a new act in the drama is about to begin. That's what Moses does with these Toledot statements. They mark the five new narrative movements in the book. And the word Toledot is translated in our Bibles as these are the generations of. So often when we come to a genealogy, we just close down our minds and we're, uh, we'll skip ahead until this gets interesting again. But Moses is actually using those genealogies as a way of indicating to the reader, and now we're moving to something new. A new act is beginning. And so we're going to see that as we work our way through the narrative. It informs the reader, pay attention. A new theme is about to begin. So we have creation, corruption, judgment, promise, and plan. This morning, we are not even going to get into the very first movement of the book because given how much time was necessary to set all of this study up, I don't have much time left. I, I think you guys are probably glad that I'm aware of this reality. I need you to remember earlier when I said that the length of a passage would look different each week, that it would, it would vary greatly. And I need you to remember that because this morning we're going to be looking at only four words. That is not going to be normal. I need you to believe me when I say that. It's not going to be normal, but we will move faster, just not this morning. Look with me, if you would, at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The opening verse of the Bible is doubtless a verse that is familiar to many or most of you, perhaps even memorized by many of you. But no matter how familiar with it we may be, it is a verse that is startling in its weight and its implications. We're not even going to consider the whole verse this morning, only the first four words. In the beginning, God. Before the first star or constellation. Before the first moon or planet. Before the first atom or particle of matter. Before the first ray of light or the first whisper of wind. Before even time or space as we have known them yet existed, God was already there. The Bible begins with the simple and yet completely incomprehensible thought of the God who is there. The Bible does not begin, as we are so often tempted to do, with a set of philosophical proofs in order to demonstrate or justify God's existence. Nor does the Bible endeavor to explain God's existence to us as though we were owed some kind of proof or justification or explanation of God's existence. We are not. There is an arrogant absurdity in the created thing demanding an explanation or a proof or a justification of its creator. And the Bible just begins with an astounding statement of fact that when nothing else yet was, God was. And it states this fact almost in passing. It, it, we're about to jump right into the creation. As though the fact of God's eternal existence is something that should just be assumed by the reader. That no matter how inconceivable it may be to our feeble minds to imagine a time that existed before God that it would be even more inconceivable for us to imagine a time when God did not, in fact, exist. I'd like to briefly consider with you four reflections from these opening words of Genesis 1-1. Observation number one, God is not dependent. The philosophical way of saying that same thing would be to say that God is not contingent. In other words, God's existence does not depend upon something or someone else. He is not beholding to anyone or to anything. Nothing made him, nothing created him, nothing sustains him. Nor has anyone or anything preceded him. He is uniquely, gloriously, and necessarily self-existent. 
When, when God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, as Pastor Dave read for us earlier, Moses asked the question of God, who am I going to say sent me? In other words, Moses is asking, who are you? And God's response to Moses is, you will say, I am who I am sent you. What is it that uniquely and exclusively distinguishes God from all other created things? It is that he alone is I am. To him alone rightly belongs the title of capital B, being. To him alone. R.C. Sproul once noted that human beings should really not be called beings at all. We should rightly be called human becomings because we have no being in and of ourselves. We are dependent. We are begotten. We are created. We are contingent creatures. There was a time when each one of us was not. But what makes God God is that there is no being apart from him. It is, we read in scripture, in him that we live and move and have our being. And so unlike us, God is not dependent. Reflection number two, God is beyond and outside of time. In the beginning, the text opens. In other words, the event of the creation of the universe is the moment at which time begins to have any kind of real meaning. And before time has even gotten started, God is there. And he has always been there. The Puritan commentator Matthew Henry said, In the beginning, that is, in the beginning of time, when that clock was first set going, Time began with the production of those beings that are measured in time. In other words, the created things. Before the beginning of time, there was none but that infinite being that inhabits eternity. Now, I'm very happy to admit to you that when we start talking about things like space and time, my brain gets a little bit woozy. I am a creature of space and time. I am contingent. I am dependent. I am incredibly finite. My brain isn't equipped when we start talking about things like the dimensions of space and time. I don't have the foggiest notion of what we are talking about when we start saying things like that. It simply isn't within my capacity as a finite creature to understand these things that govern my own existence. Yet it is precisely my own inability to understand and comprehend what exactly we can mean when we say that God exists beyond and outside of time that demonstrates the greatness of who God is. I cannot understand it. I can only confess and marvel at it. That is, Moses says in Psalm verse 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If you ask me to explain that to you logically, to lay it out for you, argument by argument, I can't. It goes beyond my comprehension. And that is precisely what makes God, God. This helps us at least begin to wrap our minds around the mind-bending truth that Peter expresses when he says that to God, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years. It's like how in C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, how Time in Narnia, time in Aslan's land, never quite corresponds to time in the real world. Yet at the same time, we, we read in the scripture that God acts at the right time or at the appointed time. And so in some mysterious way, God is both completely unaffected by our time, and yet he is greatly concerned with our time. And I think there's a beautiful paradox in that. That God is at once gloriously outside of all time. And yet, he condescends to enter into time for us. Reflection number three. God is not subject 
to change. Because God's existence is not dependent on anyone or anything, and because he exists beyond and outside of all time, God is not subject to change. The theological term for this is immutability. God is immutable, meaning that God is not subject to change. Yesterday, I had the honor of officiating the funeral for Mike Reed. Death has a, a powerful way of reminding us, of confronting us, that you and I are very much subject to time and change. That as we read from Moses earlier from Psalm 90, that you and I are like grass that springs up in the dew of the morning and withers in the afternoon. That we are from dust to dust returning. So why does it matter to us that God is not like us in this way, that God is not subject to change? It matters because of who God is. It matters because of His essential character. It matters because of God's essential being. It matters because God's promises and His love and His grace and even the life that He offers to us does not change. Because He is the same yesterday, today, and forever because our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Martin Luther endeavored to ask and answer this question, in a mighty fortress is our God. What is it that makes our God a mighty fortress, Luther asks. And Luther answers that he is from age to age the same. Reflection number four. God is greater than we have imagined. The fundamental manifestation of sin in the human heart is pride and self-centeredness. And there is no greater display of that pride and that self-centeredness at work in our lives than in how often we conceive of the universe as revolving around us. Human idolatry has always sprung from the desire to create and fashion gods who will serve our needs, who will warp the universe to fit my particular wants and that we can control and manipulate. That is what idolatry is. But the God of Genesis 1-1, the God who alone inhabits eternity and whose being establishes reality and the foundation for all other existences, that God cannot be tamed or domesticated in order to meet the requirements of our fallen hearts. Nor will he bow the knee before our idols. This God himself declares to us, to whom will you liken me among the gods? There is none like me, he declares. And Genesis 1-1 immediately establishes that you and I have to deal with a God who is far greater than we can possibly imagine. A God whose immensity and infinity, and eternality, and immutability defy all of our feeble attempts to explain them. And it is this God, this God beyond our greatest thoughts, this God beyond all description, this transcendent God, who we will soon see, somehow delights to draw near to His creation and to His people. And all of our hope, all of our reason for being is bound up and who God is. And the good news is that He is greater than we have imagined. None above Him, none before Him, all of time in His hands. For His throne it shall remain and ever stand. Because in the beginning, God. Our hope and our confidence rests in the God who is there. That is our foundation. And it is a foundation that lays the groundwork for act one of human history, creation. Let's pray. Fathers, we consider even just the first opening four words of your word. We discover that when all your mercies and all your character, our soul surveys, that transported with the view, we are lost. 
in wonder, love, and praise. Oh God, you are so worthy, worthy of our worship, worthy of hearts and souls that are devoted to your glory. Father, the only response that we can possibly have to looking for just a moment, gazing for just a moment at your essential greatness, the only response is worship. And so we do that now in Christ's name. Amen.